Good evening again, everyone. And uh, it's my pleasure today uh, to introduce Marc Alban Miller, who is a senior lecturer in the University of Cardiff. And uh, Marc Alban is going to give us uh, an exciting talk about how we can use geology to reconstruct ancient or past uh, volcanic eruptions. So Marc Alban, I think uh, now you could share the screen with us and uh, you could start your presentation. Okay, thanks very much, David. Um, yes, that should be now and this. Okay, so I think you should be all be able to see now. So yes, today um, I'm going to talk to you um, about how geologists can actually study past volcanic eruptions, um, and this is obviously a major concern in terms of risk um, and hazards in in some populated areas. Um, and, you know, like there are many uh, places in which like, we don't have historical records and we still need to know what happens uh, because they, they might carry, they might carry um, significant risk to the popula to local populations. Here is an example here in my title slide of the city of Auckland, okay, with this in actually quite sizable volcano here, which is called Rangitoto. Um, Auckland is the biggest city in, in New Zealand, it's about one and a half to two million people. Uh, and this volcano here is only about 700 years old, okay? So you could imagine that if such an eruption could occur right in Auckland Harbour right now, the city would actually be in big trouble and there would be massive, uh, you know, human and economic consequences as well, okay? So this is, this is really the, re the reason why we do this work is, uh, you know, so how, wh what's the role that geologists and how can geologists help in, in doing this, this work, okay? Um, because there's many questions in here, and uh, many, like the first one is actually time. Okay, how often does this volcano erupt? Okay, a specific volcano erupt. What's the frequency and how long for? What was the duration of that eruption? Okay, what can we expect? And all of this is try to basically understand the behavior of any specific volcano. What were the characteristics of these eruptions? in terms of eruptive style, was the lava just erupting calmly and slowly and just you know, going down the flanks of the, of the volcano, or was it actually an explosive eruption, okay, which, which would be much more dangerous, for example? Uh, what was the kind of volume that we can expect and the area affected as well? Okay, um, and then actually we're going to look at eruption dynamic. We would need to look at eruption dynamics. What is continuous? Was it stop and start and sort of jittery? Okay. Um, and so the questions and answers and approaches are going to be different from every volcano that you're going to look at. You cannot simply use the same method over and over again and blanket out, blanket out every volcano on Earth. That would be too easy. However, there are some common threads, okay? And one of the things that I'm going to highlight to you today is actually detailed petrographic and geochemical work on key um, uh, archives and, and key um, com uh, components of volcanic eruptions. So either the glass shells, or the crystals themselves, okay? And how we can use novel technology in uh, chemistry laboratories to actually say a lot of things about, about the, um, these questions here, okay? So, you know, volcanic deposits, they are like, a, they look like a book. They are like a book. So we just need to find a code to decipher them, okay? And how to be able to learn how to read them, okay? So in here, you know, I see, I can see two, two uh, good examples. Uh, on the bottom left here, these are permission ash layers from the type of volcanic zone in New Zealand, which I've got to, uh, to uh, work on, and I will present some stuff at the end of this talk on, okay? Uh, and these are actually students here nicely wearing their, their high-vis vests, uh, working on it on a, on a field trip that I used to lead uh, when I was living in Wellington. And then here, this is another highlight of New Zealand. This is the Tongariro Red Crater um, in the Tongariro Volcanic Zone. Uh, in New Zealand as well. So both of these are, are different types of eruptive deposits and both of them needs to be understand, uh, understood correctly. Okay, so quite often actually historical, historical archives will be able to help, okay? And we know this because the first volcanologist ever, okay, was Pini Yonga, which he was just this person that uh, actually started to describe the eruption in, of Vesuvius at, uh, you know, in 79 AD, uh, the one that, that destroyed the city of Pompeii. And he actually just started describing what was happening. And, you know, this is, these are, um, you know, there are many records like this in his, over history. These are absolutely essential. But that does beg the question, you know, are these, I know, are these records giving us a complete enough picture of what happened? Um, 
And also, what do we do in volcanically active places where there are no historical records whatsoever? We still need to understand these. Um, and also, that, understand, that, that also uh, implies that we can only st study uh, volcanic eruptions through these kind of records on, on volcanoes that act on human timescales, but not actually uh, volcanoes um, actually work on these kind of timescales. We do know that there are volcanic events that are actually huge, extremely rare, and so rare that humans actually have never witnessed them. And then here I'm talking specifically about super eruptions, and this will be the second half of this talk. Okay, um, so in here I'm going to mainly talk about New Zealand volcanic activity here, and that's because this is a place that's first of all very close to my heart. I used to live there and work on these volcanoes, and I'm going to talk, take two specific examples here. Uh, the first one is what we call the Auckland Volcanic Field, okay, which is composed of 53 volcanoes that were that are erupted present within the city itself, okay, and the latest one, the youngest one. Um, Occur, like erupted about 700 years ago, so we know it is an active field, we just don't know when it's going to erupt next. And because you have a city of one and a half million people in there, there's huge risks involved here. Um, and the second one is Lake Taupo in the Taupo Volcanic Zone, okay, which is here on IAL photo from GNS Science. And Lake Taupo is a completely different beast. This is the youngest super eruption, a uh, super volcano on Earth. This, um, this uh, specific lake creates momentous volcanic eruptions, um, and I'm going to detail that uh, a bit later in this talk, uh, and the youngest one of them is uh, occurred about 24,000 years ago, okay, uh, the, you know, with uh, some of the eruptions basically being, you know, 300,000 years ago or so, or even a million years ago. So we know this is going to happen again, we just don't know when, okay. Um, so how about in, you know, in both cases, the first thing we'll need to do uh, as geologists is field data. And field data is absolutely crucial. Okay? We cannot do our work as geologists uh, on these kind of deposits, uh, on these kind of questions, if we do not have a good record of, of what the field um, uh, data is. Okay? So the first Auckland Volcanic Field, or AVF, map is actually about 150 years old. Okay? Auckland uh, city and uh, uh, city is now covering most of the area, so we know we need to complete it, but we don't know how because actually the city has built over these volcanoes. Sometimes they've been quarried over, just been bulldozed over, and we sort of we need to understand where they are now and and how they formed. Okay, I'll stress as well that you know when we talk about historical records, New Zealand doesn't have these historical records. Okay. The first, uh, you know, Europe, Europeans arrived about, you know, in the 1700s, late 1700s, and that's when the historical records, uh, records start. Before that, the Maoris that were there, or Pacific Islanders that were there, actually did not keep historical, written historical records. Okay. Um, and so, you know, if you look at the, the Tarpo Volcanic Zone here, so that's the, the, the image on the right, Many of these TVZ, Taupo Volcanic Zone deposits, show these structures are actually rare, but absolutely huge. And in here, I just highlight one deposit from one eruption that happened about a million years ago, which is called the Cape Kidnappers eruption. And especially, I'm going to highlight what we call the Ignambrite deposit. Ignambrite is this volcanic deposit that, rather than ash that just spewed out and then calmly settles down, Okay. This is actually what we call these surge uh, pyroclastic flows that simply fall down the ash color, the, the, the volcanic column, and then just spread on the floor like this, laterally. Okay. This volcano, this specific eruption, pardon, this specific eruption in, is named after a cape in New Zealand that is located here, right there, 300 kilometers away from the vent. And this is because the deposit there of the ignimbrite, this natural surge of, of uh, you know, hot uh, ash and uh, air and ash, is actually flowed right up to there across the land, and the deposit is still about two meters high. Okay, this is absolutely monumental in terms of eruption. Okay, so how do we study these events that we haven't been able to witness and we have no records of? Okay, so. I'm going to first focus on the AVF, and in here, what, one way we have tackled this, and I've tackled, uh, you know, I've been fortunate enough in my career to work on, on both these um, these type of loca these localities, um, and this is collaborative work that I've done uh, with many people. Um, so in here, what, one of the things that we have done for the for the Auckland Volcanic Field is actually 
looking at uh, the sediment deposits in what we call the mar craters. Okay, so we have these crater lakes in there that have been created by you know, the earliest eruptions, but then after that, sediments have accumulated in these lakes. And in these sediments, we can actually recover the ash of subsequent eruptions. Okay, so you know they are they are uh, they've been called. Okay, they've taken a boat there, sampled, you know, drilled you know, tens uh, tens of meters of, of uh, sediment core to recover this ash. And you can see it here. This is a picture of a sediment core that has just been taken out. And you can see these white layers there. Okay, and these slightly darker layers right there. There's one of them. Okay. Uh, there's another big white layer there, okay, um, and in here this is actually another another coarse, actually dark layer right there. These are volcanic ash layers, and they tell us about nearby volcanic eruptions. What we don't know is where the ash is coming from, okay. So you know, provided we can link this ash to specific volcanoes, then actually we can unravel the the eruptive history of the entire volcanic field, actually quite a high resolution. Okay, so in here, what we're going to do, um, is what we have done actually, is using the chemical composition of this ash to try and, and trace it to specific volcanoes that match these compositions, these chemical compositions. So we're going to you know, use this as a correlation tool. Okay, um, and what, what, how do we do this? Well, you know, that means that we sample the core in here and we collect all these little glass shards there. So that's kind of painstaking work there. Um, and then we just bring them uh, into the lab. So this is the lab here. This is not the lab we used at the time. This is the lab that I co-founded in Cardiff University and, and I'm leading with, with my uh, you know, uh, colleague, Martin Anderson, who is right there. Okay. And uh, I would say that you know, this, this lab and, uh, and uh, score here from each of these volcanoes, will each volcano will have this distinct chemical signature. So provided we can measure this, uh, this chemical signature to a, a, degree, a, pre a high precision, uh, to a, a precision that is high enough that allow distinctions between volcanoes, um, then we can actually use them as correlation tools. Okay, so, so yeah, so what we call those as well is little ash layers, they call tephras. Um, a downside of this is, of course, you know, when a volcano blows, the wind transports the ash. Okay, and the wind may have been like you know, blowing the wrong way, and the ash layer doesn't fall into the right crater lake that we are sampling. Okay, so you know this is why we need these kind of projects are actually massively wide ranging. Okay, these are you know projects that takes a huge amount of people and a large amount of money of public money. So we need to know that make sure that that you know we're doing things right. And this is this project is here that is led in Auckland. Uh, it is led by Professor Jan Lindsay at University of Auckland, and it's called the Devora Project, which is for determining volcanic risk in Auckland. And so, and Jan has done his fantastic job in pulling all this together with elements of social sciences as well in there, risks, urbanism, and, and this sort of more geology-facing approach in there. And she's done a standard job at this. This project is actually still ongoing uh, to this day, to to better the work. To, uh, yeah. So. Back to the geology. So we know we have now collected our ash. So you know what we did in this case is obviously we hired a PhD student to do the job. Um, and then what we did is actually we got access to six of these different sediment cores in different lakes or uh, around Auckland, like you know quite circling Auckland in there. Um, and then so she did the sampling. She analyzed all the tephra layers um, and then also analyzed the the chemical composition of, the, of each of the volcanoes that we could still sample. Um, and then that was simply correlating the ash layers across the entire volcanic field. And in here, this is you know kind of painstaking detective work that she did, where these are the, each of the individual cores with each of the layers that she recorded here in black. These are the ash layers, and then another core here, another core here, and then she basically said, okay, this correlate, this chemical combination match between here this layer and this layer here. And this layer here, this is the same ash layer that can be correlated across different cores. And this allows us actually to sort of uh, relatively time these sediment cores and, and get an idea of the ordering of, of these volcanic eruptions at the very least. Okay. What we also have done is that you know, we can get an idea of the uh, relative dating of these eruptions that way and which volcano they come from. And then we go to the volcano and we date it using radiometric techniques such as Argonne for example. 
And at the end of the day, so this is like you know, three, four years of work for her just to do, just do that. And at the end, well, she'll put, we'll put it nicely in a PowerPoint animation, which is there. Um, I will point out that this is Jenny Hopkins that has done this work um, under my super, course supervision. Okay, Jenny doesn't like to be taken in picture, and so that's the best picture I could get of her uh, still to this day. And so, yes, yeah, she has done this animation here, which I'm going to present to you. It's going to last about 30 seconds to a minute, but that shows you essentially what we could work out of, of how volcanic activity evolved in Auckland over the last 200,000 years. Uh, there we go. That should be going now. There. So it started up in the north there uh, with these volcanoes called Pupuki and Anipoto. Um, and now we are down to about 160 million years until it moves now to basically the central part. Um, in there, Albert Park here. So it started up in the north and then moved gradually south originally uh, and in the Tuisha Center. Uh, each of the, uh, the these are uh, the volcanoes there that we are highlighting. So um, we are now down about 100,000 years and you see we only about had about 10 volcanoes erupted so far, okay, in the first 125,000 years of, of volcanic history. And you can see now that there's more and more volcanoes. It starts to accelerate, actually, uh, over the last you know, 60,000 years. Okay? And we know we're still only about halfway with 30,000 years to go. And now, really, between 30 and about 20,000 years ago, really, we had a burst of volcanic activity with quite a lot of the volcanoes around Auckland being uh, generated, okay? being erupted. Okay. And now it seems to have died down a bit, so there hasn't been only one eruption over the last 10,000 years. However, this is also the biggest one. So is it because the field is changing in terms of its behaviour, uh, or was it a last hurrah? We don't know, and that's why further research is actually very much needed in this project. This, this Devora project is still very much ongoing. One thing now, like I'm going to switch to the second part is, uh, you know, what about the Tuapu volcanic zone? So that's, you know, that completely different volcanic system in New Zealand that is, you know, completely like, much less frequent, but with uh, an eruptive behavior that is so much more destructive. Auckland, very small volcanoes in the grand scheme of things, most of them quite effusive, the lava is, you know, quite um, uh, running down. There are some slightly erupt explosive ones, but not, not very much, not to the scale of the Tuapu volcanic zone, which is, devastating eruptions. Okay. So this type of volcanic has uh, generated, amongst others, there are other eruptions in there, but four super eruptions over the last 1.2 billion years. Okay. With the last one about 27,000 years, 25,000 years ago, which is called Uruanui. Nui. Okay. Um, the last eruption, which is not a super eruption, but a significant eruption still, was about 1800 years ago. Um, and to give you an idea, what we call a super eruption is about 400, uh, over 450 cub kilometers of magma, okay? 450 cub kilometers of magma could fill the Loch Ness about 60 times over, right? So we are talking about an eruption that instantly or within weeks erupts a volume of magma that is, could fill the Loch Ness about 60 times. Or if you want to put it as uh, an ash layer, so to know that's the eruptive product at the end, so we should compare the volume of ash, that's about a thousand kilometers cube of ash. So if you want to do it kind of from a Welsh perspective, this could bury whales in about 50 meters of ash, of hot volcanic ash, instantly. We are talking here about absolutely massive uh, volcanic deposits, okay? Um, the last eruption was about only 100, uh, 800 years ago, but, you know, only 120 cubic kilometers of magma, so not a super eruption, but still devastating enough. I've seen the deposits of, of these eruptions, I've, I've shown students this, these deposits uh, for years, and, you know, you can find them hundred hundreds of kilometers away, and they are still very sizable deposits of several tens of centimeters to several meters. Uh, something that would, you know, to nowadays would be absolutely devastating for human life and uh, for, our, for any economy, for that matter. Okay. So how do we tackle these, these you know, slightly different deposits? Well, again, uh, we're going to go this time to you know, look at the field data. It's, it starts always in the field in this case. Each layers in here, so these are multiple layers of, of, um, of ash, of volcanic ash. Each layers represent an eruption or the phase of an eruption, because not all uh, eruptions are going to be necessarily continuous. Okay? 
Um, periods with no eruptions um, are not simply not recorded. They are periods when the soils actually might start developing. Okay. So in here, the top at the top of this outcrop here, you have this layer here, which is the 1800 years ago um, temple, like the last lake temple eruption, which is called the Hatsipi eruption. Um, and in here, you have another one here, which is about 1200,000 uh, years. This is this eruption there. Um, and, you know, when I was talking, oops, sorry, uh, when I was talking about, you know, what happens when, when eruptions actually do not happen, but we still have soil developing. And this is what we mean by soil developing. This is this orangey color in there. The ash, which is mostly silicic, high silicic or white, actually starts this color and be, you know, the, the uh, iron starts to get leached out, but the iron gets left behind. That gives this this orangey color. So that that's a, is a paleo soil, soil essentially, that's, that is developing. So how do we read that code again? Um, I want to say that, you know, to this work was, was mainly done in collaboration with, with Professor Colin Wilson, who is a fellow of the Royal Society. Uh, and he's one of the most foremost experts in, in uh, on super volcanoes and he works in Wellington there. And I did this work uh, with him and uh, a PhD student again, uh, that we were supervising together uh, on, on, on the younger super eruption on earth. So, these kind of super eruptions, they're not uniform events. They are so massive. They have their own structure and their own history, okay? But the layers in the deposit reflects what we think are pauses in the eruption cycle, okay? And in this Oroonui super eruption deposit, you know, the 25,000 years old one, what we thought is that we identified and, and uh, these 10 distinct phases in the eruption. That means that if we had 10 uh, distinct uh, phases, we also had nine breaks in it, okay? So what are those breaks? Okay, how long are they? Is it, you know, the time for you to make a coffee? Or is it, a, you know, a lockdown, for example, that has been going on for, you know, weeks and months? Um, is, it, is it, you know, and why is that actually? Why do we have um, these sort of uh, pauses and starts and stops? Uh, is it because the magma supply actually in the magma chamber stops, you know, is waning and, and coming, uh, you know, coming and going essentially? Or are there external control on the magma chamber, whether it can actually uh, vent or not? You know, is it the, cr the crust itself that has stresses on it um, that, 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 you know, that is stopping or promoting eruptions or actually stopping them? And in particular, in the next few slides, I'm just going to talk about in here this very first uh, small layer, okay? Um, this is a fossil soil here, so we know that's, you know, before that, that's the start of the eruption is at the bottom of this layer, right there, if you follow the mouse there. And then we have this bright uh, grey uh, layer here in there that is actually, you know, a bit discontinuous. And that's the, the reason why we think that is, if, is that uh, this deposit has been reworked. Okay, um, and that's the, what we call the phase one of this eruption, and the rest of it is actually phase two. Okay, so what we see is that they have mapped after that the, the, this, this phase one of this deposit. Um, you know, Colin has done this extensive work in mapping these, in, in finding these, these uh, starts and these phases and mapping them. Uh, it's about less than 0.1% of the volume of the eruption overall. So it's really, really tiny, that phase one. Uh, but what it did uh, does is been reworked. So, you know, we have this evidence of redistribution, um, but no soil has been formed. This layer is actually still bright gray. Um, that indicates to us that this pores has, has, has been, you know, long enough for water to be actually be flow on it, uh, but not long enough for the soil to develop. And that indicates weeks to months, not much more than that. Otherwise you would have, uh, uh, the soil is starting to develop on it, not much shorter, otherwise you wouldn't have had the time to actually rework that deposit. So that's the idea, weeks to months break. How do you do that? You have a pocket of magma, a huge pocket of magma that is ready to blow, and you start, and you, you just let out a tiny amount and stop, and stop the tap, uh, shut the tap, switch the tap off straight away. How does that happen? Well, again, so we take uh, a student here, this is Aidan Allen in there, and I was to study these deposits. And what he did is actually collected a lot of the pumices, okay? And in the pumices, what he focused on is um, 
many crystals in their phases, and especially pyroxenes, because they actually quite their chemical composition is and they, uh, they, they take a lot of trace elements, chemical elements in, in them, and they can be quite really useful to actually trace down the chemistry of, 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 the, mag of the magma and its evolution. So what he did is that take, take the two, uh, took these pumice from the field, crushed them, and then picked out all these pyroxene crystals and then you know, laid them in epoxy mount to be taken into the lab and analyzed. This was really painstaking work, and then do that on repeat, of course, because you know we get we get some work done, we get some kind of heal, get some samples, get some work done on them, learn from them, then target another another area of uh, another locality for further work. Okay. And what did he learn? Well, okay, so you know we are looking at the ordinary super eruption, 550 cubic kilometers of magma, massive, 73 Loch Nesses, okay, and we have this months-long time break between after the first phase of eruption. What he did find, though, and one of the, the, the questions that he was uh, trying to answer was how does that happen, is that this first phase is also the only phase in this whole eruption where we have a specific mineral called biotite. Okay? This is the only time uh, that we have biotite included in that, in that specific volcanic deposit. So that makes that, that first phase even more unusual in the context of this super eruption. Okay? And so this map has this distinct composition. And what we did find is actually that we analyzed the, volcan um, the, the deposits from uh, another volcanic system, which is called the Northeast Dome system, which is about 15 kilometers away from, from the Lake Taupo. Um, and it actually matched. Okay? What we did see is that, and this is you know, a plot of the calcium content versus the potassium content of the glass, actually, of, of these pumice, is that this is the all the pumices from phase two to phase 10 of the over eruption. We can see that they all clustered together. They are very invariant. This is in blue here, the blue triangles, all the pumices from the Northeast Dome system. Okay. But if you look at the phase one uh, pumices and the glass in the pumices, they actually range in between the two. So what that means is that that phase one, uh, uh, the magma erupted in a phase one of this eruption was actually contaminated a mixture between magmas that were from the northeast dome system and magmas from the overall Oranui structural caldera system magma chamber. Okay, so we do have evidence of contamination and essentially a plumbing system that was active in between these two magma chambers at the time of eruption. What is that? What is that? You know, how does that happen physically? So what we think here happens is that we have this massive fault actually between the two, mag the two magmatic systems. Okay? New Zealand is a highly, you know, very tectonically active place. So what we think happened here is that there must have been some seismic control uh, on, you know, we had a magma system that was ready to blow and some seismic control on it that allowed opening of the plumbing system to an extent that magma could actually mix together and then erupt. And then those tectonic structures must have relaxed somehow after this crisis of seismicity, and they closed again. But by then, the magma was probably really primed to erupt. And then when it blew up after a few months later, then it went for good. Okay. This is what we think happened here. So this is my last slide, and I hope I've you know, um, shown you or you know, uh, piqued your interest in, in how geologists can actually understand uh, big volcanic eruptions or, you know, uh, volcanic eruptions in, in, in a wider context. And uh, yes, I'll uh, you know, very much uh, happily answer to any of the questions that you have. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Mark Albon, for that uh, very interesting oh, talk. sorry, I just had one more slide. <laughs> okay, right, there you go. <laughs> uh, um, So, yeah, so basically the question was actually, you're talking about super eruptions, um, but how long does it take to assemble one? You know, do you take millions of years, tens of millions of years, or is it actually much shorter than this? And when we talk about uh, you know, volcanic eruptions that, have, that humans have never witnessed, then, then this is you know, becoming an extremely important uh, question. So this is also a part of, 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 uh, of Aiden's work there. So what he did is actually took those py uh, little pyroxenes um, that I mentioned earlier in, a few slides ago, um, and he imaged them in this, this what we call an electron microprobe. An electron microprobe is very good because it can give you um, uh, this contrasted black and white image that are sensitive actually to the chemistry of, of, of the mineral in question. And in here, it's actually the ratio between iron and magnesium here that we are imaging with the contrast. 
with uh, the, uh, the lighter color being the more iron rich, uh, yes, and the darker color being the more magnesium rich. So what we see here is that what we call we have a zone crystal. And the zone crystal actually just tells you that the magma composition has evolved throughout uh, um, the, the crystal has been uh, formed in a magma that had a change in composition through time. Okay, this core of the crystal is the older part, the rim here is the younger part. So it grows, it grows, but it grew in a magma that had a change in composition. What is really key here is that iron and magnesium actually try to re-equilibrate. They don't like to have to be in a crystal that, that has this viable composition. They like to be all the same. They, have, you know, they like to be evenly distributed. And so they do this re-equilibration by a process called diffusion. And diffusion is great because it is time sensitive. We have a clock there. And what we can do here is simply take um, an idea of how diffused these boundaries are uh, in here, and now we can then actually have an idea of the time, of the resistance time of this specific crystal in the magma chamber. Okay, this is, this is really, really good information for us. So of course, like, you know, there's a lot of, you know, uncertainties in there, so what you need to do is actually take a lot of pyroxenes and then, you know, see, uh, see how much, like, you know, if they give you a consistent answer. And so this is why you picked so many pyroxenes here uh, for, for a, a single sample. And so in basically what he did here, so he did all these, what we call diffusion uh, ages. And this is uh, a probability plot. So this is all the results uh, you know, given in there. And what you see is that you, know, you have a lot of, of these uh, ages that are around 300 to 500 years, but some are coming up to about 15, 1500 years. This is the oldest age he got for that super eruption. What he tells us is that the eruptible magma body that, you know, the, the magmas that ended up being erupted was formed within less than 1500 years. And we are talking about one of the most significant eruptions of the last 100,000 years on Earth, something that would devastate an entire country. So these, these big super eruptions are absolutely, you know, we, we don't see them on human timescales, but they are actually building on human timescales. So they can be actually very, you know, very dangerous and you know, we could have one building up right now that we don't quite know about. Okay, so yeah, so I think that's it now. I'm nearly done. I am done and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to your questions. All right, great. Thank you, uh, Marc Albon. Uh, so yeah, that was a nice compliment actually to your uh, earlier uh, talk. So I think there are some uh, questions coming through which I'm going uh, to read for you. Uh, the first question is about diffusion in crystals. So is diffusion in the crystal affected by temperature and pressure? Um, yes, it is affected by temperature. So we need to have an independent constraint of the temperature of the magma. Uh, that is absolutely correct uh, in here. So you know, what we do is actually use uh, crystals uh, that are actually in equilibrium with the pyroxenes that we know form with, from the same magma uh, to get an idea of the temperature. Uh, um, and this is why uh, what we do here is um, the, this diffusion actually stops really usually under 700, 800 degrees. It's, it's diffusion becomes extremely slow and essentially stops. So this is why we are not time like we are timing the uh, the formation of this crystal and the but we are timing the time between the formation of this crystal and the eruption and not the formation between the formation of these crystals and the present time. It's because once the magma is erupted, it cools down and then we, those clocks, the diffusion clock stops, okay? Pressure, no, it doesn't, pressure does not affect or uh, diffusion or to a very secondary extent. So the range of pressure variation that we have in, in magma chambers would be insignificant effects on the diffusion timing. Great, thank you. Uh, any other question? So please feel free to use the Q&A option if you want to ask other questions. I've got a question, mm -hmm. uh, kind of a broad question. So you mentioned that uh, a lot of the eruptions that took place over the last, you know, uh, few thousand years in New Zealand were really, really big. And that the volume of magma that was associated with this eruption was also extremely big. And then you, you said, actually, it doesn't take very long to store all that magma before the eruption. 
uh, in the upper part of the Earth's crust. So, and, and you said then that that means, you know, we could have uh, a, a major super eruption building up relatively quickly and perhaps we think an area is safe and it might not be safe. But in that case, because the volume of magma being injected into the crust is so big, wouldn't be able to kind of measure deformation at the surface, uh, especially with modern technologies like uh, GPS? Uh, absolutely, we would. Um, honestly, I think we would. Uh, a a geophysicist would, would be a more, more better place, but um, I guess it all depends as well at, at what depth the, the magma is stored. And in the case of the tap, the Lake Tapo, uh, it is stored somewhere between three and eight kilometers uh, the, uh, deep. So, you know, we're talking about injection of something uh, into the crust. Uh, yeah, probably we would be able to. One thing to note as well is that the re one of the reasons why we have this in New Zealand is that um, and I'm just going back to, um, oh, of course, this is, uh, <laughs> I've gone back to the animation. Um, so it, it is that the, this type of volcano is actually in a rift zone. So we do actually make continuously, we, we continuously make room for more magma to accumulate in the shallower levels of the crust. And, and that is one of the reasons why we have such short time, short time scales for, for these kind of eruptions. So in, in a way, like uh, New Zealand and the type of volcanic zone, it is kind of a, a special case here. Uh, um, me, well, that's there. So yes, so basically this is the type of volcanic zone here. And this is, this is a volcanic zone uh, and a rift zone that is opening uh, this way. So continuously spreads and, and opening sort of uh, like, like two um, needles on a clock going clockwise, essentially. So you do make the, the, this room for more magmas to come up. So yes, I would say, yeah, we probably would be able to, at least in the final stages, measure ground deformation. Yeah. Excellent. So that's kind of reassuring, I guess, especially if you live in New Zealand, so, although they've got so many problems. Yeah. And actually, the, the, so yeah. since, since then, Colin has, has been working uh, a bit more and now got a big project and actually trying to to, to nail that a bit, a bit more. Uh, it's called Eclipse uh, and with many PhD students and postdocs working on the more, uh, you know, responsive and uh, aspect of things. Yeah, interesting, great. Uh, yeah, there's another question. Uh, each volcano has a distinctive chemical signature, uh, so the magma has a different uh, composition. Doesn't this evolve over time with possible confusion as a result? Um, that is correct. Uh, in most volcanoes, in Auckland, the, uh, the main thing is that each we know that each volcano only erupted once. Uh, so that, that is really helpful in that regard. So, you know, they have this composition, we know that this ash erupted, and that's it, after that magma never came back. Uh, this is what we call a monogenetic volcanic field. Uh, so yeah, so essentially we, you know, uh, the difficulty there is that if we were only taking one single sample, out of this volcano, just taking the rock that is the easiest to find from the car park, for example, we would be underestimating the viability within that volcano. So each of these, uh, we have, uh, you know, sample 10, 15, 20 samples sometimes, depending on how big the volcano is, to have a good idea of the range of composition present in that volcano. But, you know, the fact that actually uh, these volcanoes only erupted once, uh, you know, or were active in one go and after that died out, uh, was 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 uh, pretty handy to, to do. That, that's uh, pretty handy to do that work, and that's why this method worked there. But then may not be applicable in the, exactly the same way everywhere else. So, um, so yeah, that, that is the reason. Why. But that's also part of the danger in Auckland is that we know that if magma comes back, it's going to come back somewhere it hasn't erupted before. And we need to find out where. So yeah, so that, that's parts and parcels of, of, of you know, the studying a monogenetic volcanic field like Auckland. Oh, great. Uh, so there is no other question in the uh, Q&A panel, but I might I ask a final question. So because I think it's interesting uh, as, as a general principle uh, or idea, uh, you mentioned that we can constrain or calculate the pressure of uh, emplacement of the magma. Mm -hmm. How do we do this? Um, so what we do again is actually the, the chemical composition of, of the crystals um, uh, are dependent on, on many variables. So you know, when 
so that, that, that happens that uh, you have the chemical composition of the magma, the temperature and the pressure will affect the chemical composition of, of the crystals uh, being formed in, in slightly different ways. And, and some crystals actually are going to be different, uh, like, uh, are going to be responded to these different parameters in different ways too. So some elements as well may, may be more sensitive to that. So there are, it, it really depends on, on what you have in your rock eventually. Uh, some some uh, minerals like amphibole, for example, is, has been demonstrated to have a chemical composition that is highly sensitive to pressure uh, and melt chemistry. Uh, so what we, and this, this is a massive area of research in our field, which is that uh, a lot of people, you know, basically do experiments and they try by, you know, cry, uh, they take magma compositions and then they crystallize uh, experiments under control with, temp with controlled temperature and pressure, different minerals, they see the composition and then they can basically work out how, uh, you know, from the chemical composition of the magma, how, uh, Back, back estimate temperature and pressure just for me. So yeah, it, it is a long painstaking experimental work uh, that is then, you know, when we have the experimental results, we then basically test them out uh, uh, in using natural examples. Yeah, cool, but, but then that means eventually we can use the composition of minerals from uh, yes, volcanic- Yes, that is, that is the idea, yeah. To, to uh, reconstruct so was... pressure, temperature, of crystallization and how long these crystals are crystallized. Yeah, no, th this is why the, the, the crystals uh, are, and the chemical composition of crystals is, is an invaluable set of information, it proves a, an invaluable set of information. Um, it is the provided you can measure it precisely enough and, and put it in the right geological context as well. Great, thanks a lot, uh, Marc Albon. I don't think there is any other question, but uh, thank you again for this very exciting very much. Uh, talk. Thank you all for coming again. Uh, if you're returning or coming for the first time to uh, the GeoTalk webinar series, so uh, this is the conclusion of this event. But uh, that series is not uh, over yet. So next week we're going to have Dr. Jack Williams talking about earthquake hazards along the uh, east rift of Africa. So until then, I hope you all keep safe, and I'm looking forward to meeting you next week. Goodbye. Goodbye.